Okay, so good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this, which is the second of uh, BGS webinar uh, in a series highlighting some of the key areas of scientific research in in BGS. My name is Chris Turbett. I'm the observatories manager in the geomagnetism team, um, based here in the Lyle Centre, um, and I'm joined tonight by with by Will Brown, who's a, a magnetic field modeler, and Gemma Richardson, who's a space weather researcher and um, just to talk a little bit about the science we do geomagnetism um it's all about studying measuring the magnetic field so we're going to talk about how we, how we measure it um how what the research we do to try and understand how the magnetic field where it comes from how it changes and what those changes mean to us in our daily lives um we are based here in the lyle center in edinburgh but the work that we do is truly global so we work on very closely with um, other researchers and institutes all around the world, um, governments, um, uh, partners in industry and public, et cetera, to, to try and um, advance the, 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 the research that we do in geomagnetism. And the schedule of this seminar tonight is it's divided roughly into two. Um, for the first part, myself, Will and Gemma will talk about um, uh, our research in geomagnetism. Um, and what we do with the we get the data that we gather, uh, what applications we put it to, we'll show how everybody's carrying uh, one of our magnetic field models around in their pocket um, all the time. And um, we'll talk about how the magnetic field and how it changes related to one of the most spectacular natural phenomena that uh, we can see in the UK in the Northern Lights. Uh, the second half, to use a football an analogy, I know that uh, football's kicking off in 45 minutes time, but um, the second half will be an opportunity for you to answer any questions that you might have on our work. So if you do have anything to ask, um, either now or something that might come up in, in the talks, then uh, please just pop them in the Q&A and it will come back to them in about 45 minutes time. Now. So uh, the magnetic field and so Nearly everybody's measured the magnetic field at some point, and if they've ever carried a compass, and some people know, uh, usually if they're carrying a compass, then they have to make a, a a correction between magnetic north and true north, and that's an angle that we call declination, so it's called variation. And people know that if you're going to make that declination correction, um, that depend it's quite dependent on where you are in uh, in the country or in the world. That declination value changes. And they have to have an up-to-date value for declination, uh, so that it changes over time. That declination value. So, so that's one one aspect of our work is to provide that information in the UK. But actually, compasses and and the use goes go back nine hundred years to to um to China, where uh, pieces of lodestone were used to orient uh, quite crudely but um, to, uh, to align towards magnetic north. Um, and they were used not particularly for navigation in those days, but were more for feng shui. And it wasn't until about um, the 1300s when compasses came to Europe um, and were used for navigation that people started to wonder why um, or how compasses worked and how that was related um, um, to the earth. And there was lots of theories in those days about how a compass would work, and maybe the North Star was uh, was magnetic, and and the compass would point towards the Pole Star. But it wasn't until about till the 1600s where William Gilbert published his uh, work *De Magnet*, in which he proposed that the Earth itself was magnetic, that it was made of iron, and that's um, and that's what the compass was being attracted to. So that started the the signs of geomagnetism effectively um, at that time. Um, and in the background there, there's a map that was produced by Sir Edmund Halley um, uh, around about 1700. And it shows his work in mapping the magnetic field across the Atlantic Ocean. And as he did that, he could see that the magnetic field varied depending on where you were in the, in the world. And he also noticed that the magnetic field changed with time. It was drifting westwards by about a fifth of a degree per year. And that led to people 
then continuously measuring the magnetic field. So the first observatories, magnetic observatories were set up initially in Germany, in uh, Göttingen, um, in 1832. And magnetometers, the instruments for measuring the magnetic field were developed then um, to, to regularly measure the magnetic field. And those instruments developed to not just measure the direction of magnetic north, but also to measure the magnetic field in three dimensions, to measure the field strength as well as its direction. The first observatories in the UK um, were in London, so Q Observatory and Greenwich Observatory were established shortly later. And those observatories ran quite successfully uh, up until the, the start of the 20th century, when in London they electrified the, the railway lines and those large currents in the railway lines and through the ground severely impacted the magnetic field record and the observat observatories were forced to move ultimately to where they are located today and run by the, the British Geological Survey. But before they moved, there was a quite a significant event in 1859 when there was a very large, sort of rapid change in the magnetic field, so-called magnetic storm. And it was quite significant because it severely impacted the technology of the day, which is the telegraph system. And also it was coincident with aurora that were noticeable really quite far south down around the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. Um, and Jim will pick up on this later, but one of the real significant points is that it was it, it was tied to an event that was on the sun um, uh, about a day beforehand. And that connection was made. And that was the birth of the science as we know it um, and space weather. And that's something that we're really quite focused on today in understanding space weather and its effect on modern day technologies. And so nowadays we run a network of observatories in the British Geological Survey. One of them is in South uh, in, in North Devon at, uh, at Heartland, and this is this is what it looks like. But that's part of a network now that we have of nine observatories, three of them in the UK, not just Heartland, but also Lowick and Shetland Islands and Estelmere, which is our oldest observatory, nearly 120 years old in uh, Dumfries and Galloway. And we have newer observatories that we've established in the South Atlantic, because you can see in the South Atlantic there isn't a very dense um, number of observatories and so to get a better picture of how the magnetic field uh, is globally and how it's changing globally then uh, we've established these uh, these observatories and we'll go on to talk about how the, the data from these observatories are used in the modeling work that he does of uh, the main or the core magnetic field of the earth we also have three observatories in in north america and they're particularly um They've been put in specific, specifically to provide data um, for the directional drilling industry and uh, so industry partners. And I'll come back on to talk a little bit about that in a minute. So what is that? An observatory? Well, an observatory is there to, to sit on the surface of the earth to, to measure the natural field sources. And they can come from, as we'll see, from a number of different places. Um, but in particular, they are very different in amplitude. We've got some very small, rapidly changing signals, as well as some very large, slow, varying signals. So the observatories have to be very high resolution, very precise, very accurate, um, which first of all means that the environment that they that work in has to be very, very clean over long, long periods of time. We're trying to measure signals over decades. And so we have to make sure that the environment of the observatory doesn't change, that it's free from magnetic interference, whether that be from cars or from transformers, mobile phones, et cetera, um, on a daily basis, as well as over long, long periods of time. Um, and at these observatories, we run high resolution instruments and we keep this in very carefully controlled environments, not just magnetic free, but um, we sit them on stable pillars so that they are um, very, very stable over long periods of time in a temperature controlled environment and then we back up those instruments with um, high accuracy and manual survey measurements so um, this is our colleague Ben at Heartland Observatory and he'll make a measurement uh, of the magnetic field by hand once a week to 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 be able to uh, calibrate our, uh, our um, variometers our, our, our instruments and so that we can have a con this continuous very high resolution high accuracy record. And the BGS observatories are part of a network, a global network of um, nearly 200 observatories. 
And we provide a service to these observatories in that we um, uh, collect data from them. We run a world data center for geomagnetism in Edinburgh, where everybody sends in the data, and then we make that data then publicly available for um, research purposes. And as well as, and we use the data over there, for, we use the data from those observatories ourselves, and we gather data also, not just from the observatories, but also from satellite missions. So we'll talk a little about a, a Euro European Space Agency mission that's currently in operation, and that's providing survey data, gathering data from all over the world. We also go out around the UK uh, making spot measurements. So we have an annual program where we visit sites um, uh, every year, go out and make manual uh, very accurate measurements. And that provides us with the extra detail around the UK to be able to um, understand the magnetic field and how it's changing across the country. And then we'll gather data from any other available source, whether that be survey data gathered by plane or by ship or by, any, by people. Um, and we put all those data, and, and we'll describe this in detail, we'll put all those data into mathematical models of the Earth magnetic field, whether that's uh, regional models or global models. And then one significant application of those is, is uh, in mapping. So we provide the, those, that information to uh, mapping agencies, whether that be the Ordnance Survey or the Hydrographic Office who produce charts, marine charts. And so the compass corrections that you see on these charts model um, charts come from our models that, um, that we produce here in the British Geological Survey. In terms of applications, um, navigation is still one big application of, of the magnetic field. Um, so for example, the directional drilling industry, so where, they, where they're drilling subsurface, they use the magnetic field to provide them with a direction of the drill bit. So they use a, a very sophisticated three-dimensional compass at the end of the drill string. And we provide them with um, uh, up-to-the-date real-time information. So we provide them information within a couple of minutes of recording at the observatory. We'll send them uh, to the directional driller. So they've got um, precision reference information for to be able to correct the, the drill string and the direction that they're, they're drilling. And this is particularly important at, at, you'll see it, um, at high latitudes where the, where the magnetic field can vary really quite significantly, quite quickly. And then Gemma will go on to describe uh, another uh, significant application in um, what we call geomagnetically induced currents. So this is where we get very rapid changes in the magnetic field can affect infrastructure such as power distribution networks or communications and GNSS, et cetera. Um, so we'll pick up on that. Again, that's another real-time service that we're running 365 days a year. So where, well, if you do measure the magnetic field in an observatory, where does it come from? Well, the 95% of the field that you measure at the surface at a magnetic observatory comes from the liquid outer core of the Earth, where it's made of mainly iron and nickel, and it's convecting, it's moving all the time as the Earth cools. And when you get a moving conductor like that in a magnetic field, um, ultimately it 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 um it produces current, which produces a magnetic field, which is means that, that it's self-sustaining. It, it it maintains its own magnetic field over time, but it does change. As those convection patterns change over time, it, it, it means that the magnetic field, the main magnetic field that from, of the Earth changes uh, over slowly with time. So that's why you need to update your compass um, correction regularly. And But that, that field effectively looks like roughly as a dipole field. So that if you, if you did the iron filings experiment around the Earth, it would, it would look a very similar pattern to that around a magnet. However, the magnetic field lines aren't quite symmetrical as they would be around a around a magnet, um, because the Earth itself sits in the solar wind. So this is a stream of high speed high speed particles that are traveling from the sun, which have the effect of compressing the magnetic field on the sunward side and elongating it on the um, on the night side. And that can change very quickly depending on the changes in the solar wind. So if there's a, a, an energetic event, an explosion on the sun uh, of particles where the solar wind picks up speed and, and density, then that can buffer our magnetic field and we can detect that as magnetic field changes at our observatories. So what does the data, what does the data look like that we record from 
our observatories? Well, this is a magnetogram. So this is 24 hour record from Estelle Muir Observatory on the 1st of July last year. At the top is declination. So the angle between magnetic north and true north, which is um, about one degree west. Uh, I mean, Clayton North is one degree west of True North. And on the bottom is the magnetic field strength. Um, and what you can see from that is over a 24-hour period, you can see there's this almost sine wave magnetic field changes. And this is the effect of the Earth just rotating over 24 hours in the solar wind. And so you can see it changing from the night, time, night uh, side to the day side and then back to the night side again, you get this pattern where in Estelmuir on that day, it changed by about quarter a quarter of a degree. And the field strength changed by about one part in a thousand. And that's what we call a quiet day. And if we zoom out to an annual plot, you can see that um, I've highlighted in gray there where the 1st of July is. You can see it throughout the summertime that pattern was repeated nearly every day. Um, very what we call quiet. And so if nothing else is happening, that's a pattern that we would see. There's a couple of things to notice on this, this plot as well. If you look at the top of the plot, you can see it's mainly black, and at the bottom of the plot, it's mainly white. And what that's showing is there's a gradual drift of the magnetic field. So magnetic north is drifting eastward over the course of that year, 2023, by about a fifth of a degree per year. And so this is the this is the change that we see from the outer core of the Earth from the main field to the Earth, it's drifting very slowly. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. And then on top of that, you can see that there's some days where it's not quite in a nice symmetrical pattern and there's a bit of deviation. And so one day is, say, this day here on the 24th of March, where um, there's the declination changed by about one and a half degrees. And that was a result of a coronal mass ejection on the sun a couple of days earlier. So this is this large violent event on the sun that traveled across um, space between the sun and the earth and hit us and affected our magnetic field. And these events tend to happen in, I don't know if you can pick out from that plot, but it tend to happen round about the equinoxes, round about spring and autumn time in particular. So around this, this time of year is probably the best time for these events to occur. Um, but it doesn't, it's not restricted to those times. So for example, uh, this little bit of active period in December last year was um, due to an active region on the sun. This is a picture of the sun from the SDO telescope run by, operated by NASA. NASA. And it's, um, it's showing a very large, significantly large solar flare that occurred in, um, and that emitted X-rays. And so high, high energy um, radiation that took not a few days, but but just uh, eight minutes to travel across and impact us. And then on, on those days, there was reports in North America, uh, particularly of radio blackouts, or, uh, radio communication problems from a number of radio operators, including pilots, etc. So this is just one small event that can happen um, due to events on the sun. And then just to bring it up to date, this is a picture again from this uh, NASA's STO spacecraft showing the sun on Saturday. And you can see you can see the magnetic field lines on the sun. So the sun is its own magnetic field. Um, and as these evolve very violently, um, you've got these large events. Um, and on Saturday afternoon, there was a, um, a, a large coronal mass ejection and a flare associated with it. And that led to significant magnetic storm on the Earth um, the following day. So at the bottom, there's a plot of declination um, from our observatory in North Alaska. And that uh, shows that the uh, when that storm impacted, we had a swing of about uh, 10 degrees in declination. So as a compass needle would have swung by about 10 degrees over a couple of hours at that time. And you know, the, the magnetic field changed in, in strength by about six degrees at that time. And that was also coincident with uh, Aurora sightings in Northern Alaska, unfortunately. It hit us um, in the middle of the afternoon, so it wasn't perfect for Aurora watching and on on this. So Gem is going to pick up um, in a minute on the um, some of the other significances of of this um, of this type of space weather event. But first of all, I'm going to hand over to Will, who's going to talk us about the core field of the Earth and um, our work in measuring and modelling um, that. And so I'm going to stop sharing.
Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, just give me a second to share my presentation. Okay, so yes, uh, hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Will Brown, as Chris has said, and I'm a geomagnetic field modeler. So what that is will hopefully become clear while I'm talking. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about how we map, how we model the field, and then uh, about uh, what some of the applications of that are. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, we have uh, observatories. Uh, BGS runs nine, and I've highlighted them on this map in yellow stars there. Um, but there are a couple of hundred run by different organizations all over the world. So if we're interested in mapping the field, uh, in looking at what the magnetic field looks like across the Earth rather than just at a single point, then we need a lot of measurements. So observatories are fantastic for measuring the time variations of the magnetic field. Because they're at a fixed location, uh, then the only thing that changes is the magnetic field there. So if you keep making repeated measurements, uh, then you're building up a nice record of how the field changes in time. But what you don't see is how it changes spatially, so you can't map it across the globe. What you need is a network of observatories, uh, something like this. Uh, and so we do have that as a couple of hundred that have been around. Uh, the earliest ones were established in about the 1830s, 1840s. So some have been around for uh, coming up to 180 years almost. Uh, obviously, some are much more recent than that. So uh, historically, they were very biased towards being in Europe and then uh, always very biased towards the Northern Hemisphere because observatories have to be on land to be in a nice, stable, quiet environment. And most of Earth's land is in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so that is one slight drawback to trying to map the field with just observatories. Uh, you also have the issue that there's only about a third of Earth's surface that's covered by land, so two thirds of it is ocean. So you'll notice on this map that while there are some very remote observatories in the South Pacific, for example, or the Southern Indian Ocean, most observatories uh, are just on the continents. Uh, there's very few over the oceans, and the oceans are a very large area. Uh, so what we have uh, in the modern day are not just ground observatories, but also satellite measurements. So satellite measurements provide us with uh, almost the opposite case to ground observatories. They're never in the same place twice because they're flying at about seven kilometers a second at several hundred kilometers altitude. So very fast moving, um, but they cover the earth very quickly. So uh, there is currently a mission, uh, a European Space Agency mission, that's ESA, called SWARM. Uh, it's called SWARM because there's three satellites, which is a very small swarm, admittedly, but uh, they're very expensive. So three is what we got. So there are three identical satellites, uh, very imaginatively called Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Uh, Alpha and Charlie fly side by side as a pair at an altitude of about 450 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and Bravo flies above them at about 530 kilometers. So this is what's known as a low Earth orbit. It's relatively low for a satellite. Uh, and these are quite big satellites. So they're about nine meters long, and half of that is this big boom sticking out of the satellite and on that boom, the reason for it being there uh, are the magnetometers at the end, this white box, and in the middle, this other white box with bits sticking off it. So the magnetometers are placed on the boom because it keeps them away from all the electronics going on in the body of the satellite. So there's minimal interference uh, with the measurements there. So Swarm was launched in 2013, so we've had it for just about a decade now. Um, but for about the last 25 years, we've had almost continuous dedicated geomagnetic monitoring satellite missions like SWARM, uh, a, su a succession of them. And so for the last 25 years, we've had a really, uh, really good time to be a geomagnetist uh, in that we have an incredible amount of information from the Earth's surface with all those observatories and from satellites. Uh, and so the SWARM satellites, as I said, fly very quickly. Um, so they're in what's known as polar orbits. That is, they orbit over the poles, top to bottom of the Earth. The orbits take about 90 minutes each, so they do about 15 orbits a day. Uh, and the orbits of Alpha and Charlie and Bravo are in kind of separate planes, so they drift apart from each other and back together again slowly over a few years. Uh, but what really happens is that as they're flying over the poles, the Earth turns underneath them. Uh, and so if you look at a map of where the satellites go, so this is a map showing the tracks the ground tracks, as in the, the point below the satellite, if you were to map it as though it had been at the surface of the Earth, uh, where one of the satellites goes over about a week. So you can see that in the span of a week, you've covered quite sparsely, but you've covered the Earth's surface. 
So a really excellent tool for providing measurements scattered across the Earth really quickly. Uh, it takes about four months for the swarm satellites to get a nice, dense, even sampling across the whole Earth's surface. Um, but obviously that's a, a very different picture to what we get from ground observatory. So between the two of them, we have some really excellent uh, combination of widespread and really time sensitive me measurements. Uh, what we're interested in is mapping the field. So what we need to do is say, well, we have a bunch of measurements and they're always measurements from the past because we have to have made them, processed them, fiddled around with it and then looked at them. So they're always telling us what the magnetic field looked like at some point in the past, maybe yesterday or last week or 10 years ago. What we really want to know is what the magnetic field looks like now in the place I am at the time I am, um, or in a week's time at the location I'll be there when I want to navigate or uh, whatever it might be. So we need some means to take the measurements that we have and turn them into predictions, estimates of what the magnetic field will be like at a different time and place. And we want to be able to interpolate between them, fill in all the gaps uh, and so on. So what we need is what I will call a magnetic model and why I'm a geomagnetic modeler, um, but effectively a mathematical map, a representation of what all these measurements uh, tell us about the field, a kind of best fit to all of them at once uh, in a mathematical sense that provides us with a tool, uh, a really useful tool to allow us to estimate the magnetic field wherever and whenever we want. Uh, and so this little picture I'm showing you on the right hand side here is uh, an image of a magnetic field model. So it's showing two things. It's showing the magnetic field at Earth's surface. So that's this outer sphere where the red and the orange bits are telling you that the field is pointing outwards from the Earth and the blue bits are telling you that the field is pointing inwards to the Earth. And then because it's a nice mathematical model, we can extrapolate it down to the surface of the core where the magnetic field is being generated and we can map the magnetic field there as well just by using the measurements we made at Earth's surface and out in space. And you can see that the magnetic field there is actually much more complicated. It's not just one hemisphere of red pointing out and one hemisphere of blue pointing in. Uh, there's little bubbles of red and blue and there's some red and blue in the opposite hemispheres to where you might expect them. So you can see that the field is very complicated uh, down at the core. And as it comes out towards the surface, it kind of smooths out um, and gets a little bit weaker as you move away from the core. So uh, we have a bunch of measurements made in the past. We feed them into this mathematical process to build a model to make this map of the magnetic field. And then with this model, we can use it as a tool. We can tell it the time and place that we want to know about, and it will give us an estimate of what the magnetic field would be like there, which means that not only can we look at the times where we had measurements in the past, but we can extrapolate it forwards a little bit into the future. And we can uh, say, well, where will the magnetic field, what it would be like uh, in say a week's time. So you can get something like this. So this is an example of a, a tool that we have on our website, a calculator using something called the World Magnetic Model, uh, which is a model we produce along with some US partners uh, as a sort of publicly available uh, magnetic map uh, and you can put in the location. So here I use the example of Edinburgh, which is where I am, uh, and today. So it will tell you back uh, what the magnetic field from Earth's core looks like today in Edinburgh or any other place. It'll tell you the strength and the direction and the rate at which it's changing. So from mapping the magnetic field like this, uh, we can see uh, a huge amount of information. So it tells us that the magnetic field is very complex and that it changes in space and it changes in time. So this little red and blue ball in the bottom right hand corner here is a globe showing uh, magnetic declination. So the angle between true north, geographic north and magnetic north. And you can see that some places it's red, some places it's blue. And that's telling you if declination is eastward or westward of geographic north. Uh, so we can see that uh, it's not constant. It's quite a complicated pattern. Some places it's zero, some places it's quite far eastward, some places it's quite far westward. It really depends on where you are. Uh, and if we look at this black box uh, on the top there, that's this square map area. So we're looking at uh, an area across the North Pole. So on the left of this map, we've got Northern Canada. On the right of this map, we've got Siberia. And what I'm showing here in these pink and red dots are the location of the magnetic North Pole. So the magnetic North Pole is where the magnetic field points vertically downward into the Earth's surface, exactly vertical. That's what defines a magnetic North Pole. Uh, and you can see that in 1900, it was back in Canada and then uh, slowly drifted up to 1950, up to the year 2000, and then quite rapidly uh, accelerated 
for a couple of decades uh, over to where we are now, um, heading towards Siberia. So we can see from mapping the magnetic field uh, over time that field changes, things like the where the North Pole is will drift in time, and that change can be sometimes quite slow, sometimes quite quick. The rate of it can vary. So from the year 2000 to about 2020, the magnetic field, uh, the North Pole rather, got up to about 55 kilometers per year uh, at the speed it was moving. It slowed down a little bit since then. It's now, now about uh, 40, 45, 46 kilometers a year, something like that. Um, but still a bit quicker than it was back in 1900. This is a natural variation um, to do with how the field is being generated in Earth's core. So the reason this is both interesting and a challenge is that if we're interested in mapping the magnetic field, uh, as I am, and if we want to use it for particular uh, things like navigation, then as I said, we want to be doing that in the future. So we want to be able to extrapolate the field uh, out into the future. But as you can see from the rate at which the North Magnetic Pole moves, it's not constant, it's very unpredictable. And that is a challenge, but also means we're still in a job. So that's quite good. Uh, so this chart here, is showing us the rate of change of the declination angle over the UK from 1900 up to uh, last year. So about 125 years of the rate of change of declination in, in the UK, uh, compiled by all the UK observatories that have existed in that time. So you can see that the field changes at a fairly steady rate uh, for sometimes decades, uh, but there are these abrupt changes where the field accelerates and changes really quickly. And these are known as geomagnetic jerks, uh, not because they're irritating, though they are, uh, if you're in this business, but because uh, in mechanics, uh, if you keep uh, taking the rate of change of distance, you get to velocity. The rate of change of velocity is acceleration. The rate of change of acceleration is known as a jerk. So the name has been borrowed from, from mechanics there. Uh, so you can see that there are, at various times, these very rapid changes in the rate of change of the field and those are unpredictable. Uh, we know that they're caused by rapid changes in the way the flow of Earth's core is organizing itself, but we can't predict them. So forecasting the field a long way into the future uh, is very difficult. So we need to keep making measurements and keep mapping the field to try and keep a track of these changes. So they're relatively small uh, and slow drifts. Um, for a geological process, they're quite quick. For humans, they're quite slow. Uh, so the scale on this uh, is in arc minutes per year. So an arc minute is a 60th of a degree. So you can see that it's uh, something like uh, a small fraction of a degree per year. Uh, so why are we interested in this? Why are we interested in the magnetic field? Well, because it has uses for us, um, not just out of uh, you know, intellectual curiosity, uh, it's a practical tool for us. So if we want to navigate, as Chris said, uh, if you have in the UK an ordnance survey map, then it will provide you with information on the sheet such as telling you what the grid north location is, so which way up the map is, uh, but also giving you this really useful bit of information telling you which way magnetic north is for that area that the, the map sheet covers, uh, and what, therefore, the angle you should correct your compass by to have it line up with the map so that you can make a measurement of the magnetic field with your compass and orient yourself relative to the map. Uh, so that process, uh, maybe, uh, is useful if you're doing some hill walking or some orienteering. You might think that that's a very niche use, but uh, as Chris alluded to, we all have something doing this in our pocket all the time, and we're using it way more than we think. Uh, so this process can be automated if you're doing it computationally rather than manually with a map and compass. Um, so if you're using something like Google Maps or Apple Maps or other uh, mapping apps on navigation devices or GPS in your car or plane or boat, satellite, whatever it might be, then you might see this little, uh, in this case, blue cone indicating roughly which direction you're facing so that you can orient yourself. And what's going on there is your phone contains a magnetometer, like a 3D compass that is measuring the magnetic field. And it's using underneath the World Magnetic Model that we help produce uh, a model of the magnetic field to say, well, in this location, the magnetic field at this time should look like this. And you've measured this so I can work out the difference between them and I can tell you which way you are facing. So you can orient yourself. And this is a really useful tool because magnetic field permeates everything. Uh, it is everywhere. Uh, you can sense it with a very simple bit of kit. Uh, magnetometers are not hugely complicated and you can miniaturize them, stick them in a phone. Uh, so you have the ability uh, to do this kind of uh, navigation, provided you have a good model of the magnetic field 
and one that's been extrapolated a bit into the future so that it can be useful uh, as you're trying to use it, as it were. Uh, so it's a really useful, say it's a natural signal that you can measure. And because of that, it means it can't be jammed. It can't be, the signal can't be lost. It can't be spoofed. Um, it is there naturally and very easy to monitor. Uh, so this goes into all kinds of things. If you use some kind of augmented reality app on your phone, lots of virtual reality equipment is very popular nowadays. Uh, then your phone is using gyroscopes to sense the changes of uh, motion of your phone, and it's using a magnetometer to tell you which way you're facing. Um, but uh, as Chris also said, uh, there are really uh, useful applications in industry, so directional drilling. So this image at the bottom here is illustrating a, a drilling rig and the uh, uh, boreholes, the, the wells being drilled out from that platform, and you can guide the uh, magnetometer behind the drill bit around based on having an understanding of what the magnetic field looks like, not just from the Earth's core, but also a really detailed model of the uh, magnetic field from local geology, from the rocks around you. And this is useful primarily uh, as a, a safety tool. So if you want to know where your, it's one thing to know where your drill bit is um, and which way it's facing, but it's another thing entirely to know how well you know that position. And how well you know that position tells you how safely you can be there. So if you want to avoid other things, if you want to plan out where a well should be going, then you really need to know how well you know the magnetic field there to, so that you can have an uncertainty on your position. Uh, and if it's, say, a kilometer, then you need to know that you need to plan for that well path to be more than a kilometer away from whatever you don't want to hit. So there are uh, a whole range of uses for this kind of navigation information, uh, and they're being used probably more than you would suspect. Uh, in our daily lives from uh, you know, walking to uh, an unfamiliar location with your phone uh, map out to doing some hill walking in a remote area uh, or just fiddling around with a virtual reality app. Uh, this is Pokemon Go here, for example, as well as really uh, technologically advanced kind of industry uses. Uh, so real applications to our daily lives, but also a huge amount of information about the Earth uh, for Earth scientists. So if you're interested in understanding something about the workings of the interior of our planet, then the magnetic field is an incredible tool for that because it's generated in our core and it's actively telling us what the core is doing. The magnetic field acts like a tracer uh, to tell you how the flow in the core has that has generated that magnetic field, how that flow uh, has moved, how it's changed. So this map that I'm showing you here, it's a really short animation that's going to keep repeating. And the black wiggly bits are indicating the speed and strength of the flow and the direction of it, uh, mapped as though it was at the surface of the core. But the country outlines, the continent borders there are drawn on, drawn on just for reference so you can see where you're looking. Uh, and so the strong red bits show you where the flow is quite fast. So you can see that in the middle of the map here, under the uh, South Atlantic, the flow is westward and quite strong. And then the white bits show you where it's very weak. So it can be up to uh, you know, 10, uh, sorry, 40 to 50 kilometers per year that the fluid is moving at, which is uh, quite quick. So the liquid iron in Earth's core has about the same viscosity as uh, water does. Um, so not only can we tell something about the interior of our planet and how it's operating, the Earth's magnetic field also gives us an incredible history of Earth's past. So when rocks are formed, so say a rock that's erupted from a volcano is a lava and it pulls and solidifies into a rock, uh, then it can lock in a, a record of the magnetic field that was present at the time when that rock cooled and solidified. So a lava that was erupted hundreds of millions of years ago can tell you something about the strength and direction of the magnetic field then. So if we go and make measurements, collect samples of lavas uh, and other types of, uh, of rocks from Earth's past and we can date them, we can also uh, get an idea of what the magnetic field looked like at that time. So you can get uh, so far, something like a 3.2 billion year history of Earth's magnetic field, uh, which is incredible to be able to go and actively make measurements of something like that. Uh, the Earth's Earth is about four and a half billion years old for reference, so we've got a good chunk of that. And something that that has told us uh, is that Earth's magnetic field has reversed polarity at various points uh, through history. Uh, it's happened hundreds of times uh, over the last few billion years, and reversing polarity uh, I mean that the North and South Poles have swapped orientation. So the North Pole goes to the South, South goes to the North and vice versa. And this has happened back and forth naturally throughout Earth's history. 
Uh, so the final bit that I will leave you with before I hand over to Gemma uh, is to say that, well, here is a map of the magnetic field. This is a map of the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, and it's going to link what's going on inside the Earth to what's going on outside the Earth. So we can see that the field is strongest where it's red, so it's quite strong at the poles, and it's weakest where it's blue. And you see that there's a big blue lump uh, over South America and the South Atlantic. And this is known, uh, again, very imaginatively as the South Atlantic anomaly, because it's an area of anomalously weak field over the South Atlantic. Uh, and so what the Earth's magnetic field does is shields us from what the sun is doing uh, and throwing at us in terms of these energetic particles. And so this little video is going to show all the electrical upsets that have happened on the three swarm satellites uh, caused by particles interfering with the electronics there. And you'll see that if I play this, it will run through four years of swarm measurements that they sometimes happen near the poles because at those points, the magnetic field is near vertical and particles can follow the field lines down closer in towards Earth. But they also happen very much where the field is a bit weaker and they can penetrate a little bit closer to Earth and interfere with satellites a little more often. So something you need to be aware of. Uh, and this will be my point to hand over to Gemma to talk more about space weather and what's going on outside the Earth. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, I'll just share my screen and dive straight in. So as, yeah, as Will said, I'm going to talk more about trying to actually mitigate the effects of space weather, but space weather itself is just a term to describe the effects um, the conditions in space near the Earth or at the Earth that might affect our technology. So the kind of impacts it can have are, as I say, mostly on technology. As you would expect, and as uh, Will has already mentioned, satellites are fairly vulnerable to space weather. They are up in space, so they can experience things like radiation damage, uh, degradation, and these things called single event upsets, which is where a charged particle passes through the body of the satellite um, and either does damage or potentially gives the satellite or makes the satellite think it's been given a command that it hasn't been, um, which becomes more of a problem as we move further down into a region of the atmosphere called the ionosphere, because the ionosphere during different space weather events can become very enhanced and disturbed which makes it much harder to communicate with satellites. So you've potentially got a satellite doing its own thing that you can't even see that it's doing its own thing. So that's really not ideal. Um, we also get uh, navigation errors. So things like sat navs that are reading GPS. I mean, the sat nav in your car, it's not really gonna impact because the accuracy is not very good. Um, but there are lots of industries that use precision navigation. So they need to be able to navigate to within a few centimeters. And during different space weather events, the errors introduced by the signal being disrupted as it passes through the ionosphere are large enough to cause real issues, both in location and anything that uses GPS timing. So you need to know that that's happening to be able to either correct or in some cases just stop doing what you're doing until the, the space weather activity is finished. Um, if we move down a little bit further to the aviation industry, so Aeroplanes, particularly aeroplanes that fly polar routes, can be exposed to increased radiation uh, during a space weather event. Um, it's not likely to be a lethal dose of radiation, so don't panic if you like to fly a lot. Um, but it could be enough to give a crew its entire year's worth of radiation acceptable dose in one flight. So obviously the aviation industry are very keen to avoid that because they really don't want to be paying crew to be sat on the ground not flying. Um, so they really do pay attention to space weather and they will fly longer routes to avoid the poles if there's any risk of, of space weather radiation affecting their crews. Um, then also it can affect HF radio communications, which again is quite a problem for the aviation industry because that's one of their main kind of backup mechanisms for communication. So again, they need to know that there is something that could be disturbing it before they jump to conclusions if they can't contact a plane immediately. Um, and then if we move right down to the ground, the other th effect that we get is electric fields in the ground, which can then cause currents to flow in grounded infrastructure, such as um, power grids or railways or pipelines or things like that. Um, and of course, we also get the aurora, which I will talk about a little bit more 
at the end. So space weather comes, as we've already heard mentioned, mostly from the sun. Um, so we have this solar wind, which is just a constant stream of charged particles from the sun out into space. And when that solar wind hits the magnetic field, it compresses it on one side, stretches it out on the other to give us our magnetosphere. And that's the kind of status quo that's happening all the time. That's your kind of background level of space weather. But sometimes we get these disturbances in the solar wind that cause our kind of space weather events, which is what we're much more interested in. And when in terms of events, the really big ones are related to coronal mass ejections. So these images here, they're both images. This one's just a bit more zoomed in um, called coronagraphs. So it's basically a picture of the sun and the blank disk in the middle is what's called an occulting disk. So that is just blocking out the light of the sun itself so that we can see the solar corona, and much like would happen in a solar eclipse. But instead of the moon, we've just got a man-made disk in the way instead. And if I play this video, you'll see that the corona can be very dynamic at times. And you might just catch a glimpse on this side of the image, on the right hand side, of what we call a CME. So I have a still image. So here's our CME. And they are essentially what it says on the tin. They are a, a rapid ejection of a large amount of mass from the sun's corona. So we call them coronal mass ejections. And what they're, they are is they're full of charged particles and some of the sun's own magnetic field all trapped within it in a kind of superheated gas, which travels out through space in this kind of cloud shape. So this particular one was heading off towards the side, off the side of the sun as we look at it. So I think we only caught kind of the very edge of this particular CME. If I now play this other video, um, I'm sure you all caught that straight away. Um, so what we'll do is we'll slow this down. This one is what we call a full halo CME. And when it's full halo, it means your eye, it's either heading straight towards you or straight away from you because you're looking straight into the, the front of this cloud. In this particular instance, there's quite a clue that it was coming our way because all of this snow on the camera is caused by charged particles which were flung out, um, I think, by the solar flare that was associated with this CME that travel almost at the speed of light and they smash into the camera. So you can see that satellites that are getting exposed to this all the time is going to start to do some damage. Now, this camera does recover, but over time you start to lose kind of the odd pixel or two from the camera because it's just getting bombarded all the time. Um, so once our CME is headed our way, it takes between about one and five days to get to the Earth's magnetic field. The fastest one we know about was about 17 hours, uh, but the kind of average time is about three days. And when the CME hits the magnetic field, it compresses it even further so that actually pushes some of those satellites even more outside of the magnetic field. Um, so it'll expose more satellites to that kind of issue that you were seeing with the South Atlantic anomaly. And it also allows some of those particles from the CME to get into our magnetic field and they travel down the magnetic field lines to a region called the auroral zone. Um, but the main thing is that lots and lots of energy gets pumped into our magnetic field. And depending on which way the magnetic field of the sun within that CME is directed, is how much energy gets in. If it's pointing southwards, we get lots and lots of energy gets into the magnetic field, lots more particles, and we see just huge amounts of variation in both the currents and the magnetic field within our magnetosphere. And that's what we call a geomagnetic storm, because everything is just going a bit crazy. Um, the biggest storm that we know about, as Chris mentioned near the start, is this Carrington storm from 1859. So here are the magnetograms from Greenwich Observatory, because we've, in the last um, number of years, we've digitised all of our historical magnetograms. And you can see that unlike those nice kind of smooth plots that Chris showed of a quiet day, um, these are very, very rapidly changing. And there's lots and lots of wiggles. Um, and not only are there lots of wiggles, but at times there's also gaps. 
and these gaps are because the um, the way these are measured, it's just basically a big drum of paper, and there's a, a um, photosensitive paper, and there's a mirror with a light shining it, and as that mirror moves, it shines the light onto the paper. But the storm got so big that it actually started going literally off the scale. Um, so we've got gaps in the records. So we know this was a really big event. We know it's probably the biggest one we've recorded. Unfortunately, what we don't know is how big it was, because we don't know what the largest variations were. And as you can see, because these are kind of analog measurements, actually digitizing them to get the true values out is very complicated because they cross over and there's all all sorts of other problems. Um, so that's our really big storm. So why do we care? Well, when the Carrington event happened, the technology of the day was um, telegraphs and they were affected. So some of them sparked and there were some fires. There were others that disconnected all the batteries but were able to continue talking. And that's because there were currents flowing through the lines, additional currents. Um, nowadays, we obviously don't use telegraphs so much, but we do have other technology that we um, that is affected by space weather. So geomagnetically induced currents are caused because we have this varying electrical current in the ionosphere due to these magnetic storms. And whenever you have a varying electrical current, that can induce a varying magnetic field in a perpendicular direction. So in this case, going into the screen. And that in turn induces an electric field in the ground. And where you have an electric field, you have currents start to flow. And if you have something like a power grid, which is designed to be nice and low resistance, earthed into the ground, then the GIC will preferentially flow through that technology, especially if this ground is quite resistive. And the GIC themselves, the currents are not massive compared to the kind of currents that are flowing in a, particularly in the high voltage transmission network. Um, but they act more like a DC current, whereas the power grid is designed for AC current, for alternating current. So what the GSE do is they offset everything and they can mean that transformers start to operate outside their normal range of operation. And what that does is it causes some harmonics in the system. It can cause um, what they call voltage instability. So these are all the kinds of things that cause a bit of a headache for the power grid operator because they need to keep the whole system balanced. And sometimes safety relays can be tripped and transformers will basically take themselves out of operation in a safe, controlled way, as you'd want them to do during a kind of normal terrestrial storm. Um, the problem is if they take themselves out of operation during a space weather event, so a geomagnetic storm, it pushes the problem onto other transformers. And then in the very, very worst cases, the transformer core itself can heat up due to this excess current and get quite badly damaged, um, which we don't want because transformers are very big, and very expensive and very difficult to replace. Uh, so what we do is we try and model those GIC so that we can try and help understand where there might be problems. Now this map here is showing, so each of those circles is showing an estimate of current through a substation for a particular snapshot of the Halloween storm in 2003. Now, please don't panic if you live near one of these red circles. This is not saying that any transformers would be at risk in that particular location um, because the current through a substation will be divided through all of the transformers at a substation. And a lot of these substations have quite a few transformers. But what this kind of modeling helps us to do, we can do it for lots of different storms and we can do it for the whole, like every minute in a storm. And we can build up a really big picture of where there might be vulnerable, uh, vulnerabilities and if there's substations that are being exposed to large amounts of excess current for long periods of time. Um, and then we can give that information to government and national grid so they can make sure that they address those kind of areas first and make sure that we're not vulnerable to space weather. At least that's the aim. Um, and we also do this in a slightly wider context. So we have recently been uh, working on a project called Euphoria where we're looking at GIC across all of Europe. And again, this is these are kind of indicative maps. They're not meant to be specific GIC, 
but it's a step towards trying to understand the kind of wider picture. And then another project that we've been involved in is in New Zealand as part of this solar tsunamis project. And you might think that, you know, New Zealand's a long way away, so it's not very relevant for the UK, but actually in terms of geomagnetic latitude, um, New Zealand is actually very similar to the UK. It's just in the south instead of the north. Um, and the key thing in New Zealand is that their power operator, TransPower, have actually been measuring GIC since around 2001 in actual transformers in their grid. And even more amazingly, have shared all of this data with the scientists involved in the project. And the important thing for that is we can we can build all these computer models all we like, but obviously we have to check that they're realistic. So having this amount of data allows us to do that and we can make plots like this, which is where we ha we can compare what our model is telling us at a specific site compared to what the measurements is, are telling us. And you can see that the, the red line and the blue line pretty much follow each other. There's a few little areas where we can maybe improve, but it's showing us that our modeling is actually doing the right thing. So that's really cool. Um, and then the other thing for being able to mitigate space weather impacts is to know that they're coming. Um, so we at BGS issue a space weather forecast every weekday and we try and predict for the next three days. And they're, they're human created forecasts. So there's a team of eight of us who take it in turns to create those forecasts. Um, what I would say is space weather forecasting is hard. I don't have time today to discuss why it's quite so hard but you know if you complain about um terrestrial weather forecasting not quite getting the timing of the rain right space weather is a long way away from getting even close to telling you when the rain might be um or in this case when the geomagnetic storm might be but we try we try very hard and we make those they're publicly available on our website which you can get to through this qr code and we also put them on twitter or x as it is now um, and if we think there's something a bit more interesting on the way, we also create um, a storm forecast that we send out to our mailing list. And we also, again, tweet it or exit. I don't know what the proper term for that is anymore. Um, to try and give people a bit of a heads up that there might be some aurora. But as I said, it's, it's not always an exact science. Um, but having mentioned the aurora, Let's talk about it a little bit more. So the aurora are caused by charged particles in the magnetic field being accelerated down towards the polar regions and then colliding with atoms in the atmosphere. And the colours are created depending on which of those atoms are being impacted. Um, so the reds and the greens tend to come from oxygen. So the red comes from the highest um, level oxygen at uh, green is from oxygen a little bit lower down in the atmosphere and then the kind of blues and purples are from particles that are penetrating right down to the lower edge of the ionosphere and that happens as i mentioned in an area called the auroral oval so in the normal northern hemisphere the auroral oval sits basically over iceland northern scandinavia and around and this is kind of this plot in the middle is kind of how it looks in a quiet time. This is actually a, a map showing the probability of visible aurora, but it pretty much maps out the auroral oval itself. And then when we get a big storm, that auroral oval expands and moves away from the pole. So that's why um, here in the UK, we, we do get a chance to see the aurora when there's a big storm because it moves the auroral oval moves over us. And during that Carrington event that we mentioned before, there are reports of people in London sat reading their newspapers by the light of the aurora because it was that big a storm that it moved right down, right across the whole of the UK. Um, so just a kind of final thought for some tips if you want to see the aurora. The main thing is to get away from light pollution and ideally clouds, which is a bit more of an issue often in the UK. Um, you need a clear view to the north, ideally, but as I said, in the really big storms, it might actually move to overhead, depending on where you are in the country. And the best chance of viewing the aurora is normally, as Chris mentioned earlier, kind of around the equinoxes, so around kind of 
March, April time, and then September, October. But it's also worth remembering that all these beautiful pictures that we see are pictures often taken with long exposure because we've got we've all got such good cameras even just on your phone nowadays like my night mode on my phone can now pick up the aurora without me changing any of the settings um even when i can't see it by eye it looks very kind of monochrome and kind of a bit faint most of the time in the uk so it's always worth just taking your phone out and taking a picture um, so here's my final slide just to say thank you very much for joining us. I'll leave this up for a moment or two if you want to try and scan the QR codes, but I will put these links in the chat um, as well. And yeah, thank you very much. And I will now hand you back to Chris. Thank you, Gemma. And uh, thanks as well to Will for those presentations. And that, that brings us to the end of the presentation part of the the summer has been slightly over, but um, I see we have a few questions that um, should be able to answer in the, the next half an hour. Um, so I'm going to hand over to JP, who's going to just chair for us the question and answer session. Okay, JP. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Chris, Gemma, and Will. I hope everyone uh, joining us for this webinar enjoyed it as much as I did. And thank you for making such a a complicated subject accessible to, to the late person. I, I certainly managed to follow most, most of what you were saying. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of great questions in the chat already. So we'll start. Um, the first one's for yourself, Will. Um, and that is from Roger. And he asks, why don't you use geostationary satellites for measuring the magnetic field? Is their distance above the Earth just too great to make useful measurements? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so you can make measurements on a geostationary satellite. Uh, the distance is definitely a factor. So the further away you go from the Earth, the weaker the field is because it decays with distance away from the source that's in the center of the Earth. So uh, you'll measure a weaker magnetic field, but you'll also measure it kind of smoothed out in the same way that you hear music at a distance. You hear the bass, the really low frequency, long wavelength sounds, but you don't hear the the high frequencies, the small details. Uh, same thing with the magnetic field. The further you are, you, you are away, and geostationary orbits are much higher. They're something like 30,000 kilometers rather than uh, where our swarm satellites sit at 400. Um, but also, because they're geostationary, they're in a fixed point in space over the same point on the ground. Uh, so they'd measure the field there as the Earth turns around, but they wouldn't map uh, the field across Earth's surface. So that's why usually polar orbiting satellites are what we go for in geomagnetism. But there's also a move uh, with a recent satellite mission that's just launched this uh, last year and one that's due to launch in a couple of years time that will be in a more inclined orbit rather than over the poles. It will kind of come across diagonally so that it will actually cover the Earth's surface even quicker than the ones we do uh, have at the moment. Hey, great, thank you, Will. Um, okay, this next one is for yourself. Chris, um, and I think it comes in from Bricken. Apologies, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, and he asks, why does the declination appear to follow the field strength by about 90 minutes? <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I might not be able to say why it's exactly 90 minutes, but the reason for it is because um, and that, I think it's from that plot, that quiet day plot that we showed. And on, on those quiet days, then those variations are dominated, as I said, by the Earth rotating in the sun, what's happening is the sun's heating up the the ionosphere and it's ionizing the ionosphere. So this is 100 kilometers above our head and it's causing uh, current loops to start flowing in their fairly complex current loops. And if you imagine that we're passing underneath those current loops, so it's almost like, um, like if you imagine the wind direction changing as a low pressure passes over, we see a different, the, the, those current loops change. So the magnetic field from the currents change over time. At Estelmere, where I showed the declination is dom is in a horizontal plane, and um, it's dominated by horizontal magnetic fields. Whereas field strength, because at Estelmere the 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 field lines are inclined down about seventy degrees, field strength is dominated by the vertical field. So, because there's a difference between yeah, obviously declination the horizontal and um, the field strength dominated by the vertical and these current systems flowing overhead with field with the field direction moving over time it's the interaction between those two that gives that gives that lag between the two 
between declination and field strength. So that's not too complicated to picture. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Um, the next one's for yourself, Chairman. Uh, and it's a, another Roger's asking, are the videos of the Aurora that we normally see speeded up? For the most part, yes. They're, they're normally time-lapse images. So they'll normally take, say, a 10-second picture and then another 10-second picture and another 10-second picture and then just play that at a kind of one-second rate. So most of the time, yes, they are sped up. Um, during the really big events, it can be as dynamic as some of those videos make it look. But yeah, most of the time, it's much more kind of slowly moving. And most of those videos are time-lapse videos. So they're definitely sped up. Great. Thank, thank you, Gemma. And now there's a definite theme with a lot of our questions here, and that's about magnetic pole reversals. Um, so, well, I'm going to um, stagger some of these questions. So I think, Gemma, Chris, you can take a drink of water and... Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump straight in. So the, the first one um, is what's caused the magnetic pol polar reversals and can we predict when the next one's going to happen? Right, so the, we understand some of how they're caused, but not all, I would say. It's definitely uh, not 100% uh, known. Uh, so the Earth's outer core is this uh, boiling, uh, convecting ball of molten iron uh, and it's a really chaotic and dynamic thing. So the movement of that iron, uh, it's it's a moving electrical current, uh, and that's what's generating the magnetic field really actively. So as that flow changes, uh, the field changes with it. So generally we get this slow drift, but over really long timescales, uh, then it can, uh, it can drift quite a long way. So the poles can move really far, even all the way around the other hemisphere, but also the flow, uh, this, really broad scale stuff like the, the big convection from top to bottom, um, like you'd see in your boiling pan of water, can uh, can break down. The field can become much more complicated. And when it settles itself down to a nice stable mode again, the, the dominant direction of the pole can be the opposite to before, or it can be back in the same direction. So uh, we understand that that can happen, um, but uh, the real details of exactly how that happens and when are not known in terms of when the next reversal might be can we predict them um actually i have a slide to show for this if i'll just pop it up on the screen just to give you an idea of what i'm talking about uh so this is uh what's known as the magnetic reversal time scale so uh this is starting at today on the left hand side and going back 170 million years into the jurassic on the right hand side so the uh, the age of the Earth here, the, the periods, the Neogene, Paleogene, Cretaceous, Jurassic, you might be more familiar with the dinosaur related ones on the right hand side here, um, uh, are just relatively for the Earth being four and a half billion years long. This is just a short snapshot of the recent bit of it, uh, but I'll show you what the polarity of the magnetic field is. So the uh, black bit is where black stripes are where the polarity is the same as today and the white are where it's reversed in the opposite sense to today. So you can see that there are periods where it changes very frequently. There are periods where it does not change for uh, the, the numbers here are maybe a little tricky to read, but these ticks on the scale are 10 million years intervals. Um, so you can see that you can have tens of million year of years where the field is stable. You can have changes every few hundred thousand years. Um, so it's a completely random chaotic process. And so because of that, we can't predict when it's gonna happen. Uh, we have some ideas of how the field would look before it was and after it would change, uh, but we don't know a lot about what it would look like during the change. So um, often you'll hear that we're overdue a reversal um, or that we can predict when the next one is. What that is usually uh, trying to convey is that if you average how often these have happened, then you can come up with an average number that is every 250,000 years. But that average means nothing because it's a random process. Um, the average is, is meaningless in that context. So uh, the last time a reversal happened was 780,000 years ago, um, but we don't know when the next one would be. Um, not imminently, we imagine, uh, and we're not uh, losing sleep over it. And well, just while we're on that theme, um, two other questions on that, and you've sort of started to touch on it. Um, 
how long would it typically take for the polls to reverse if if we know? And do we know how it might impact us when it next happens? Yeah, so we have an idea. Uh, we don't have a precise idea of exactly how long it can take, but we know uh, we can make measurements. So you saw from that reversal time scale, you can see when the closest measurements we have of the pole of being northward and then southward consecutively kind of gives you like a, a window in which you know it changed at some point in that time. Uh, so the, the, the trouble is that we have really sparse measurements from the rock record. So it's not like uh, our modern observatories where we measure every second or something like that. We might have measurements millions of years apart. Um, so we believe it happens in under 100,000 years, probably more, probably more something like a 10,000 year time scale. Uh, there's been suggestions that it might be as quick as a thousand years, but probably in the tens of thousands is the more reliable um, kind of estimate. Uh, there was a second part to that question. Sorry, remind me, JP. Um, do we know how it might impact us? Oh, do we know? Um, so we know that given that they've happened a lot, uh, hundreds of times that we know of through Earth's history, it has not had any obvious impact on life on Earth. So we don't anticipate any severe um, kind of impact on us specifically. Um, so the last one I say was 780,000 years ago. Um, modern humans were not around, but something very close to modern humans was around at that time. Um, there's no correlation to major extinctions or big geological events. Uh, there's no, no relation between those. So we don't know that it, it would have a severe impact, but we have a lot of technology, as we've discussed today, um, that it could be a big impact on the technology that we use if the field was to change. Uh, what we believe happens is that the field gets doesn't disappear during reversal. It gets more complicated than the simple north and south pole for a period of time, and then it stabilizes itself again uh, in a new north pole, south pole location. Uh, and so we might expect uh, a bit of disruption to our technology perhaps during that time um, but uh, that's kind of speculation um, and not not well known and what we do know is that, as i say life has persisted quite happily through these changes many times and uh, things like migrating animals that have uh, been able to survive these things and carry on their business without uh, much change the changes would be very slow probably for for most uh, people to be concerned about so it's easy to deal with a small slow change brilliant thank you very much for answering all those questions well um okay so moving back to the aurora this next question is for for you Gemma. um you mentioned that the coronal mass ejections in aurora are more frequent around the equinoxes can you explain a little bit more about why that might be yes yeah, so it's it's not that cmes are more frequent around the equinoxes they cut the sun does its own thing you know, it has no care of what season we're in. Um, but when it sends, um, when I talked, I kind of mentioned briefly that the orientation of the magnetic field from in the solar wind matters as to how well it connects to our magnetic field. And around the equinoxes, just because of the kind of angle that our magnetic field is at relative to the sun, then it tends to be more likely to connect so that we get a bigger effect on our own magnetic field and it's also when it tends to be dark as well for the UK um, so in terms of actually seeing the aurora around the equinoxes it's kind of dark at a reasonable time fairly clear skies um, so yeah so it's not it's not that storms are more frequent but it's more that it connects in a better way so we get bigger events hopefully that explained it <laughs> thank you Jared. Um, I'm just going to quickly say we're about quarter past. We've got 15 minutes left and we've got 23 open questions still, which is brilliant. And we'll do our very best to answer as many as we can. Um, but after half past eight, what we'll do, along with the recording, we'll try our best to answer these questions offline. Um, so we'll try and issue that in the next few weeks alongside the recording of the, the presentation in written format. So if we don't manage to get to your questions tonight, we'll, we'll do our best to do it in a follow-up to, uh, to the session. Um, so this next question is for yourself, Chris. Um, are new magnetic observatories being built, or has this levelled off? Where would you most like to have one, um, or where would you most like, sorry, to have more coverage? So yes, they there's new magnetic observatories have been built all the time. Um, as Will showed, there are certainly uh, areas, certainly continents that don't have very good distribution of magnetic observatories. Um, 
particularly um, Africa doesn't have a lot of observatories, so that could certainly, um, more observatories there would certainly improve. And there are some new ones that are being built there, but we do need a lot more there. Um, um, and I, the difficult thing is that so much of the the planet is covered by ocean, um, and it's very difficult to build a magnetic observatory on the ocean. But there is some research going on at, at present to try and see how we, how we can... Um, put observatories on the seafloor that will get the kind of uh, high quality data in terms of high accuracy, high resolution um, readings that that, um, that land observatories get and how we get that data back. But that's um, a tech technological development that's uh, that's needed. If you, if you give me a blank checkbook, that's what I would do. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, next question is for you again, Joan. Um, if we had no magnetic field around the Earth, would that mean no electronic devices could work due to solar winds? That is a really interesting question. Um, I don't think it would necessarily stop electronic devices working, but we'd certainly see more. Or would we see more interruption? Maybe we wouldn't actually, because it's the, the variation of the magnetic field that causes the problems. Um, for our technology. I think the bigger problem would be that without the protection of the magnetic field, we'd have lost a lot of our atmosphere. So we probably wouldn't be living quite as well as we do now, um, which might be the bigger issue than our electronic devices working if we have no air to breathe. A bit more of a problem. <laughs> Thanks, Gemma. Um, the next one's for you, Will. Um, has the geomagnetic model been used to estimate rare events of the past before 1800 when the measurements were out of range? Yes. Uh, so uh, the measurements that I showed in terms of uh, ground observatory, so they started in the 18, uh, 1830s, 1840s. But we have, uh, quite uniquely for geomagnetism in, in the world of, of physics, we have measurements of observation of the magnetic field going back for 400 years because compasses have been used um, for at least 400 years for global navigation. So we have uh, the ship's logs, records of declination particularly, uh, going back to the late 1500s. Uh, so uh, both nations uh, involved in global trade and exploration and um, major trading companies that operated shipping uh, as well as exploration um, expeditions uh, you know, sailing around the world and, and charting new uh, new land and new waters, they kept very meticulous uh, records. And so those go back uh, to, yeah, say, the late 1500s. So we have a really good idea of what magnetic field has looked like for 400 years. Uh, beyond that, then you get into the realm of having to deal with measurements derived from archaeological materials and then the rock record. Uh, and those can go back thousands of years and then millions of years, but they're really sparse and much lower resolution and really uncertain. Uh, so we can do uh, can do further back in time, but it gets progressively harder to do. Brilliant. Thanks, Will. I mean, that was a great question. Um, here's another one, this one uh, for yourself, Gemma. It, it was mentioned the time for a coronal mass ejection to reach the Earth is one to five days. But that it can also be as little as eight minutes. What causes the difference in speed of particle travel? Are those type are these different types of phenomena? Um, yeah, I may be slightly confused things a little bit there. They are slightly different types of phenomena. So the obviously the speed of light is um, means that the light from the sun gets to us in about eight minutes, and when you have a solar flare, the charged particles that come out and the electromagnetic radiation travels almost as fast as that so it's just a little bit faster than eight minutes whereas the coronal mass ejections are a slightly different thing so that big kind of cloud of plasma is slower than the kind of relativistic protons that get sent out ahead of it um so yeah they do take between one and five days and the so the fastest was about 17 hours i think that's the fastest we've ever that we know about anyway Thank you, Gemma. Um, okay, another question for Will. Is the South Atlantic anomaly fixed or does it move around the Earth? Uh, it is not fixed. Um, it is. It has been persistently in the South Atlantic for 
at least the last few hundred years, probably the last few thousand years, but it is changing. So it has drifted westward. So it, it's, it looks as though it's mainly over South America now, but uh, it's drifted from the South Atlantic across. Um, so it is moving westward, but it's also getting deeper in that the field is getting a little weaker there um, and it's expanded. So it's a little larger and it's changing shape as well. So it's kind of splitting into two lobes, one that goes up the west side of South America and one that's on the east side. Um, so very relatively slow evolution, but yes, it, it's changing and moving. Great, thanks. Thanks, Will. I'm going to open this next question up to Will or, I sorry, Chris or Gemma. Um, and this is about the fluctuations of the solar wind background outside of big events. Will it help to forecast them? Do you know if they can impact the magnetosphere significantly? Um, yes, so outside the big events, the solar wind is fluctuating kind of all the time. Um, and it does have kind of small impacts on the magnetosphere, so there's small changes happening all the time. Um, and actually it's much, much easier to forecast the general fluctuations of the solar background because it's easier to see. So we can, um, so the solar wind is kind of fairly constant. We kind of understand it and we can see how it's um, moving with time. Um, but it's these big events that completely disrupt it that are the big problem in terms of forecasting and generally have the biggest impact on the magnetosphere. Um, but yeah, we're always trying to improve our forecasting. So. <laughs> Thank you, Gemma. Um, Chris has had an easy couple of minutes, so we've got a question question for Chris coming up. How many observatories would be desirable to give equivalent to GPS? How is elevation predicted, bearing in mind Galileo and GPS satellites being disrupted? Um. I'm not sure. It's something maybe would help me. I'm not sure I understand what elevation means in that sentence. But um, GPS and and um, and human observatories are kind of measuring very different things, really. In in the in terms that the 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 compass is giving you an orientation, whereas the GPS is giving you a, a position. Um, so it's. Um, I mean, there is there's some work in, in in trying to see whether the the variations of the magnetic field of a space can give you some positional information. That's very sort of early research at the moment, and that requires really quite high density um, models of the magnetic field and how it changes. And that's really down to how the geology. Um, uh, affects the magnetic field, so it's changes in the geology that's that produces those kind of maps. So it's it's not and they're not equivalent. It's not something that you can sort of compare in that way, really. I would say, um, as but and I don't, yeah, like I say, I don't quite understand the second part of the question about elevation. Sorry. Uh, no, thank thank you, Chris. I mean, if the original poster is is still on the on the talk, if if they would like to clarify that second part of the question, do please feel free to follow up, and we'll do our best to answer. Um, this next question is for yourself, Will. Um, do we know if it's possible for the magnetic field to be lost? And a similar related question is: Do we know what role it plays in terms of life on Earth? Is it crucial to life on Earth? Do we know? Uh, good questions. Um, so can it be lost? Uh, hypothetically, yes. Um, do we expect it to be lost? No, I'll put that caveat in there uh, up front. Um, so we have an idea that uh, this is what has happened to Mars through its history, that in its past, it had a magnetic field. Uh, the magnetic field is generated by the heat trapped inside a planet when it forms slowly uh, exiting the planet. That's what causes the convection in the core. That's what keeps it hot. And it's this cooling down that provides the energy source to drive the magnetic field. So we have the idea that Mars in its early days had a molten core and an actively generated magnetic field, but the planet was a little bit too small to keep that heat in. So the heat escaped too quickly. Uh, and when there was no more energy to drive the magnetic field, uh, then it stopped. And because it stopped, 
it stopped protecting the atmosphere that Mars had and it was stripped away by the solar wind. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we believe that magnetic field is quite important to life and it, it protects our environment from solar radiation. Um, but uh, um, yeah, we don't, we don't believe that the Earth's field will be lost like that, except in the very, very distant future, um, many, many billions of years time when the Earth is cooled to the point where it might not have the energy to generate a magnetic field. But that's, um, uh, yeah, one, not a certain fact and two, a very, very long time uh, away in the future. Great, thank you very much, Will. Um, again, we've got a couple of questions now about the, the solar cycle. Uh, so I'm going to hand these over to Gemma. Um, so this question asks, the solar cycle reversals, I uh, think we are cycle 25, the question reads, are more aurora noticed during these reversals? Um, yes. So we, we are in cycle 25 and we are just about the maximum of cycle 25. Um, I'll, I'll show a quick slide because that's probably the easiest way to explain this. Um, so uh, this plot here just shows the sunspot number, which is a measure of activity on the sun. So the more sunspots there are, the more flares you tend to get and you also tend to get more CMEs around the maximum, which is the peaks in this. So when, the, when it's high, that's the maximum. And this is just over time and we are right here at the kind of, we think the maximum of this cycle. Sometimes they have a double peak, so there might be another peak um, shortly after. Um, and if I also, if I just add to that, um, in the background of the blue bars there are, is the AA index, which is a global measure of geomagnetic activity. So when that is a large number, that means there was a storm happening. And you'll notice for the most part, most of those storms happen around solar maximum. So that's why we tend to talk about things being more likely at solar maximum. But sometimes we do get storms outside of solar maximum. So it's not that we can't get them when it's quieter. So there's, there's a few examples of storms kind of happening in the quieter bits of the solar cycle. Um, but yes, we do tend to get a lot more just because there's a lot more flares. And if you have more flares, there's more chance of associated coronal mass ejections, which then um, hit the Earth's magnetic field and cause magnetic storm and therefore aurora. Um, so hopefully that's explained a little bit more. <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much. OK, we're on to the last couple of questions. So this next one is for you, Will. Um, how accurate is magnetic field modelling beneath the Earth's surface in the case of the presence of a thin layer of magnetised formation, such as pyrite, especially below this layer? Is that something we're able to answer? Uh, yes. So um, something that we didn't directly explain, uh, but we alluded to in a few cases, is uh, one of the real challenges for uh, studying the magnetic field is that when we go and make a measurement, we are measuring lots of different sources of magnetic fields. The main bulk of it is from the core. And as Gemma has been talking about, there's loads of stuff going on outside of the earth and how it interacts with the earth that we are also measuring. But we're also measuring the magnetization of the rocks that we're standing on. So earth's crust, uh, as the question says, can have magnetized minerals in them, things like pyrite metals. Uh, magnetite is uh, a mineral that's named very obviously because it's very magnetic. Um, so, uh, yes, we can also map those. The challenge there is that one, we have to separate all these different signals out, and that's part of what building magnetic field models is to do. Uh, and two, uh, in fact, you can see behind me, this image that is floating around behind my head is a, a representation of the magnetic fields coming from the crustal geology of Earth. And Earth's surface geology and subsurface geology is very complicated. So the magnetic fields that result from it are also very complicated. They're really small scale. So they don't change because the geology doesn't change a lot uh, in terms of in time. It's fairly stable, um, but they're really spatially complicated. And you need to be really close to the surface to make measurements in really high detail to get this information. So this map behind me is our best effort so far. And it's at a resolution of about 28 kilometers uh, globally, which is uh, quite large if you want to do really really precise navigation uh, but quite impressive compared to the scale of earth's core field that is like 
3000 kilometer resolution because that's about how big the features are uh, so yeah we can map really small scale stuff like the geology brilliant thank you all with that we've we almost reached the end of the, the webinar. It's happened. We've still got lots of open questions. Thank you so much for, for being so engaged and so many of you staying with us right till the very end. Um, if I may, I'm going to ask uh, end with a question of my own, if that's okay, and that's to all three panellists. Um, Chris, at the start of this webinar tonight, you gave us a bit of a history of, of the, the field of geomagnetism and how it developed. Um, I wondered if each of you could maybe predict how you see the, the field of this area of research changing over the next 20, 30 years maybe the demands for particular areas of the research um, and also how maybe the technology or access to new technology might further this this field. Um, and Chris, I'll start with your, yourself. Um, I, I mean, I really can't say it waning at all, really, that is because we are, well, if you think about well, the the field is continuously evolving, like as, as, as Will pointed out, it's, um, it's sort of a chaotic process. And um, and so it's very difficult to predict um, over even you know even short, quite short periods of time. Um, um, but um, um, on top of that, I think where we are in space weather is where probably where meteorology was maybe a hundred years ago. I don't know if that's uh, that's um, well, I think I think that's probably fair to say. Um, so there's an that all of that research that's happened in the last hundred years in meteorology in terms of understanding uh, uh, meteorology and, and computation and and sitting looking at the impacts. It's really where where um, where we need to be going for the next hundred years. So I would say that there was de decades of of life in geomagnetism. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Gemma, same question to yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, as as Chris has said, there's a huge amount of research in kind of space weather at the moment, especially as we're becoming ever more reliant on technology. So we're getting new technologies like things like driverless cars, which obviously rely on GPS and probably magnetic fields to a certain extent to know which way they're looking. So, yeah, there's lots of new things. And in the kind of move to net zero, there's a lot of changes happening with the way we use our power grids so in terms of kind of GIC research there's, there's lots of interesting things to be looking at and understanding so that we can yeah keep using our technology I never even thought about driverless cars but yeah there's yeah. so many applications you're right um so many applications and finally to yourself Will uh, yes, yeah, so technology is, is coming on all the time, uh, it means the technology for geomagnetism uh, is, is improving. So we have new types of magnetometers that could operate more stably or more reliably or autonomously, like Chris said, maybe on the seabed or uh, different kinds of satellites. Uh, we're moving towards, rather than these enormous uh, dedicated geomagnetic satellites, uh, but maybe things like cube satellites that are much cheaper uh, and shorter lived, but when they're cheap, you can build a few of them and just keep chucking them up. Um, so there are uh, the first few cube satellite missions are starting now. Um, so that's uh, definitely an avenue for new measurements uh, and new information about the field. Brilliant. Well, listen, I just want to finish by saying thank you again to, to Gemma, to Chris, to Will um, for a really insightful talk. Thank you very much to all of you who registered um, and engaged with the presentation. Um, it really encourages us to keep these lectures going, as Chris said at the start. This is the second one in this new series of lectures. Um, we'd welcome suggestions if there's areas of our research you'd like us to focus on for the next talk in a few months' time. Um, we'd be really interested to hear um, from you, so please do email us in or contact us on some of our social media channels. Um, we will follow up with a link to the recording um, in the days ahead uh, and also give us a little bit of time because there's a lot, lots of great questions, but we'll fo follow up after that with some uh, answers to some of the questions we couldn't get to uh, this evening. Um, so with that, we'll rush off, check the football scores, and um, I wish you all a very good, good evening. Thanks very much. <laughs>